Yeah, we're waiting uh, for those on, who are on the call. We will start at uh, 11.02, so just in a minute. So Harman, maybe you could go ahead and get started now. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today at Harvard Circus AI for Social Impact Seminar. This is our second to us seminar of this semester. And today I'm honored to introduce our speaker, Michael Mina, MD, PhD. He is an assistant professor of epidemiology at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and a core member of the school's Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics, or CCDD. He is additionally an assistant professor in immunology and infectious diseases at the Harvard Chan School and associate medical director in clinical mi microbiology in the Department of Pathology at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School. He earned his MD and PhD degrees from Emory University and he completed his postdoctoral work at Princeton University. He also completed his residency training in clinical pathology at Brigham and Women's Hospital at, and Harvard Medical School. Uh, Michael's research combines mathematical and epidemiological models with high throughput face display based serology laboratory investigations, including development of new technologies and st statistical pipelines to better understand the population and immunological consequences and patterns underlying infectious diseases. And with that, I'm inviting everyone to welcome Michael Mina to present his talk, Advances in Virology, Immunology, and Computation to Monitor and Control Outbreaks. Well, thanks very much. Um, so I wanted to talk today uh, about, uh, well, about different advances that have had uh, during this pandemic and, and prior to the pandemic, both in, in the biological space, uh, specifically in testing for viruses, uh, testing immunological patterns, and how those can couple to computation for uh, improving public health and infectious disease monitoring. So just to, to give a brief roadmap, I wanna start with talking uh, briefly about uh, testing for viruses and how uh, new, new advances in tests are enabling a transition to combat uh, the pandemic, this current pandemic with public health tools versus medical tools. Um, uh, I'll then talk about uh, how we can use new, new developments in, in the immunological space to monitor outbreaks and tie those to, that together with uh, thinking about what the future of, of immunological uh, evaluations will be in the context of creating a global, uh, a global monitoring system, very much like uh, the global weather system that we have today. So uh, the first 15 minutes or so are going to be around uh, testing and, and uh, the difference between medical diagnostics and, and public health tests. If you've seen me talk about this in the past, I apologize. I've been asked to give uh, talks about rapid tests a lot, um, but I want to give a, 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 I'll go briefly over it because I think it's an essential distinction between the two that we have to keep in mind into the future. Uh, so far, almost all testing uh, in this pandemic has been for personal health. It's been diagnostic medicine and it's been tests uh, that are authorized based on their performance as diagnostic medical tests. Uh, the, the major ones have been PCR and qPCR based laboratory tests. These have been uh, absolutely the focus of almost all of our testing response to date. And uh, uh, there are some new advances uh, happening sort of imminently now, but, uh, but in general, we have lagged in terms of a public health response because of a serious focus in medical responses. And this uh, I'll argue is, is one of the major limitations to our pandemic response and uh, the failure to, to address this public health crisis as a public health crisis rather than a medical versus what we've done, which is deal with it 
thinking of it as a medical crisis when it is not, it's a population health crisis, uh, has greatly limited our ability to control the virus and has led to, of course, all the um, uh, devastating effects that we've all experienced this past year. So while we have focused on personal health, uh, from the beginning, in my view, we should have focused on population health as a tool and as a means to combat this virus. Uh, while all of the uh, regulatory framework, the decisions that have been made have been made uh, considering tests as medical diagnostic tools, uh, we should and can still uh, evaluate uh, tests in particular as public health tools. And I'll go into detail of how those differ, but here I'll just describe uh, there's two different forms besides diagnostic medicine. We have population screening and population surveillance. Some of the biggest forms of surveillance using molecular biological tools are things like wastewater surveillance, for example, that is a great uh, uh, example of population health where we're monitoring for virus in wastewater, um, but also just screening individuals. If we're gonna be screening individuals as a means to prevent spread of a virus, we can't use the regular medical diagnostic tools. They're not the appropriate tools and I'll explain uh, why. And in fact, the key attributes and, and, and metrics that we need to uh, focus on for that kind of testing is unique from medicine. So in medicine, we have uh, prioritized, uh, rightly so, high sensitivity, very good specificity uh, in our medical diagnostics. Cost and frequency of a test are generally completely, uh, uh, they, they're disregarded. And the speed to get results is usually just assumed to be on the order that's appropriate for medical testing. And if that means that it takes five days to get a result back, when you're doing medicine, it's not always, that's not necessarily so damaging because you, you, you have the patient there that you can speak with and you can say, go home, you'll get a test uh, or stay in the hospital as an inpatient, you'll get your result uh, at some point. But accessibility, frequency, speed, those generally are not prioritized, especially not in, our, uh, in the way that we authorize tests. But for population screening, the test characteristics to actually use tools to combat spread are wholly distinct. Uh, extremely high sensitivity and good specificity might not be so important if they are coming at the cost of accessibility and speed to get results. Uh, for public health, speed and frequency and cost and accessibility must be factored in as much or potentially much more than the traditional metrics of sensitivity and specificity when we are considering ways to combat a pandemic like this. And so while the focus in this pandemic has been on the real-time PCR instrument, this is the type of instrument that sits in a laboratory. This is a qPCR instrument, very standard model. Uh, this is what the CDC's initial quantitative PCR test was pushed for. This is an ABI 7500, the, the initial CDC assay. Uh, these are, uh, maybe it's not uh, obvious to, from the picture, but these are not high throughput tools. They require a lot of skill. They require uh, a whole system of laboratory work to get the test, the sample into a lab, process it, um, and, and ultimately get the results out. We do have some new advances, or not so new anymore, but uh, since the spring of 2020, we've had the, the bigger instrumentation companies like Roche and Hologic enter into the picture. These are very, these are more accessible uh, laboratory-based tests. They can be very fast uh, for PCR, uh, one to three hours, and you can do thousands in a, in a day uh, on an instrument. So that sounds great, but that's not where the bottlenecks are with testing. Uh, the, the bottlenecks are, are all of the logistics to get a sample into a lab from a person potentially hundred miles away or more and uh, get it accessioned into the queue, run on the instrument. So even though the instrument might be one to three hours, as we saw during this pandemic, uh, sometimes tests were taking three, five, 10 days to return. And that's with a laboratory-based test. So if we are focused on only medical diagnostics and people are okay laying in bed until they get a result because they're sick, that might be okay. But when we're trying to keep society moving along, then a 10-day delay in a test is uh, I would say a, an entirely useless test for public health. Uh, even getting to one to two day delays uh, errs on really losing great efficacy.
So this is from August 4th uh, uh, in the New York Times on the left. It's like having no testing. Coronavirus test results are still delayed. At that moment in time, we had tests that were delayed 10 days or so, uh, sometimes 14 delay, day delays. Those, and yet nevertheless, people were still lining up to get a coronavirus test because we were not thinking of it in the right way. At the same time, uh, myself and Larry Kotlikoff, people like Paul Romer and others, we're really calling for uh, simple, inexpensive, cheap coronavirus tests like the ones you see on the bottom right there. Uh, that was actually a month before that article in the New York Times came out on the left. And, um, and at the time the world said, these are not the right tests, they're not uh, accurate enough, et cetera, et cetera, we don't know enough. Uh, and so instead we just kept doing the laboratory-based PCR testing, which was essentially uh, effective lifts. It did not have any effect to, to limit spread uh, meanwhile, we did have tools that are only now coming about. In fact, just today, uh, Abbott and, and CVS uh, just announced over-the-counter use of this test on the bottom right here. It's a very simple paper strip type of test, can be made very inexpensively. And it's now finally, uh, 15 months into this pandemic, becoming available for widespread uh, use, but uh, obviously quite delayed relative to when we really needed it. So rapid tests are public health tests. They can also be clinical tests, but there are a whole plethora of different rapid tests which are now available. Some of them are gonna be antigen tests, some of them will be molecular tests. And these are the types of tools that can actually help to limit spread. The reason why uh, a rapid test works, a rapid test is generally not as analytically sensitive, meaning you need a lot more virus to be able to detect it. Uh, but does it matter if we take a different step, a uh, different view of, of what is actually required if we're thinking about testing as a means to limit spread of a virus, all of a sudden the limit of detection has to also take into account the uh, things like time. How many hours are there between when a high sensitivity test turns positive and when a low sensitivity test turns positive because the virus is replicating very quickly inside the body. Time, however, is not at all a part of the FDA's metrics for what makes or doesn't make a good test. Uh, there's no consideration for time in any of the test evaluations. Uh, but during a pandemic, if you're trying to do public health, time is crucial, whether that's time between when the two tests turn positive or whether it's time to get the results. In this case, what I'm showing here is you have a PCR limit of detection. For example, with, with PCR, it might be around 1,000 viral copies per, uh, per milliliter. Uh, and a rapid antigen test might be 100 times less than that, meaning uh, worse than that, meaning 100,000. But when doing it for public health, that distinction doesn't really matter very much because the duration between the time when a PCR test would turn positive and a more rapid test would turn positive is just somewhere between eight and 24 hours. So if you can have a test that's much, much more accessible and rapid versus a three or five or 10 day delayed PCR test, and all you're losing is, uh, are a few, a few samples that you might take in that eight hour window uh, versus thousands or, or millions of other tests that could be performed that would find people uh, who are infectious, uh, it, it no longer makes sense to actually use the PCR test when you could have a rapid test that would almost always be uh, effective and positive when you're actually transmissible. Uh, so this is just to really suggest that we need to incorporate time into our evaluations of test metrics. And to this day, there is essentially no framework or rubric to incorporate something like time into it, even though time and frequency are probably much, much more important. Uh, and in fact, mathematically, as I'll show, they are much more important than the precise limit of detection of a test. Nevertheless, all of our regulatory framework has focused on the limit of the test and has essentially prevented, uh, for example, rapid tests from coming to market because they get compared to a PCR test. And this is also just to show in this, this, this is essentially the time course of the virus load inside somebody. So when somebody gets exposed, no test is positive. Eventually the PCR test will turn positive, which I've labeled as day zero. Within the next 24 hours, the rapid test will also turn positive. 
around 99% of all of your viral load will then occur over the next, over the next sort of four or five, six days, at which point you'll start to clear all of your live virus. And by day 10, more or less, nobody will have culturable live virus anymore, but the PCR test will stay positive for 20 or 25 days or more. Which means that from a public health perspective, the PCR test uh, during that whole yellow period right there is liable to call somebody positive. If you get your first test at day 12 with a PCR, you might be determined to be positive. You'll have to then go into isolation. But that's an, for public health, that's a bad result. You no longer need to isolate because you're no longer transmissible. And so it's actually a detriment to public health to discover somebody as positive on a PCR test at day 12 during this yellow period. Nevertheless, from an FDA regulatory perspective, for example, that is considered, uh, if you find somebody positive there, but not positive on the rapid test, that's considered a hit on the rapid test. It means it's not, uh, that's considered a loss in sensitivity. From a diagnostic criteria, that might be okay, but from a public health criteria, it actually is representative of a very, very low specificity of a PCR test, meaning for public health, the PCR test uh, is not specific and it calls many people as positive when they no longer need to be isolated. So this is just a different way of thinking about testing in the context of public health versus medicine. So testing in a pandemic is about limiting spread, not diagnosing. And I would suggest that we should be thinking about effective sensitivity to limit spread when we think about public health. And so this is just an example. Uh, it's a thought experiment. If your infectious window is six days, which it generally is, let's say six, maybe seven days, maybe some people are most infectious for four days, but on average, six days, which is why the duration of isolation is around 10. That's a conservative estimate. So if you isolate for 10 days, more or less, you won't ever be transmissible beyond that, but on average, six. If you have a lab PCR result that requires two days to return. So it takes 48 hours for you to get your result back from a, from a laboratory, even if that test is 100% sensitive. What that means is that for every three positive people detected, that is six person days walking around transmissible, which means from a public health perspective, the effective sensitivity maxes out at only 67% because you essentially for every three positive people you detect with the test that takes 48 hours to turn around, you essentially miss a full duration of infectiousness or six days worth of time across those three people when they would be spreading. So essentially from a public health effectiveness perspective, the sensitivity is really only 67%, even if it's discovering 100% of cases eventually. Uh, and that's assuming that we have frequent testing, we're finding 100% of people. But the actual effective sensitivity uh, is even much, much worse. And that's because generally most people don't ever get tested. Two thirds of Americans have still never gotten a COVID test in this pandemic. And that's because access and accessibility and, and cost have all been major barriers. Needing to get a medical prescription for a public health test has been a major barrier. And so our effective sensitivity to actually detect people in time to act, to get them to isolate before they spread to others has been abysmally low, even though we're using tests that are near 100% sensitive to catch molecules. So these are really different uses when we start thinking about uh, containment and mitigation strategies. This is another example, very similar to the last thought example. Uh, on the top, uh, this is, this is uh, uh, you could think of it as a school or walking into a building that has a test program going. On the top, you have five individuals uh, who are infectious. They walk into a building, they get a PCR test. That test takes 48 hours to return. Uh, 48 hours later, all of them get, uh, in, in the black here, all of them will get identified as positive and they'll get isolated, but collectively they've walked around for 10 person days infectious while waiting for their PCR results. So even though it's 100% PCR sensitivity, if you have a 48 hour turnaround, you're going to have every single person who is positive, uh, this, the effect of the sensitivity during those first two days is 0%. And that needs to be averaged into the overall effective sensitivity is the 0% sensitivity while waiting for results. Because we can't realistically ask everyone 
to isolate every time they get a, a, a swab taken. On the other hand, if you have a rapid test that's going to be say 80% sensitive, uh, you, have, uh, you have the same five individuals walk into a building, you immediately isolate four of them because it's 80%, so you find four out of the five. One person gets through and, and goes on and it maybe infects one or two additional people, but overall, and then they get another rapid test, say on day three, that's two person days versus 10 person days walking around infectious. So even though it's a less sensitive test, the speed is absolutely paramount here to preventing spread in a workplace or a school. Nevertheless, speed still to this day is not considered in any way, shape or form in our regulatory framework, in our sensitivity metrics, in, our, in the utility of a public health tool. And this has been uh, one of the strangest omissions uh, that I can understand during, during this pandemic. And so the frequency of testing, of course, if you're not testing frequently and you're not testing, I mean, you could take it to an extreme and say, if you never test somebody, then the best test in the world won't ever find that person positive because they never use it. Uh, if you scale that to frequency, uh, essentially what it means is if you're only testing people, say once every two weeks, then even if you find somebody as positive on a PCR, it's very likely what I'm showing here in the left graph here is that when you actually do find them as positive, they're most likely post-infectious already. So you're, so you're not going to stop them. It's a, it's a, yes, you're finding them as positive with RNA in their nose, but it is not a useful test at that point because they're already beyond their infectiousness. On the other hand, if you have a cheaper test that can be done very frequently, say even every day, uh, or every few days at home because these tests can take 30 seconds to perform you know, at your kitchen sink or something or your bathroom sink. Uh, a test like that might be a uh, hundred or a thousand times less sensitive, but because the virus grows to such high numbers, uh, if, you're, if it's a test that you can use frequently, then it's going to be much more effective. And so on the right, I'm showing the test frequency. And if you were to model, what would the uh, uh, benefit of frequent testing be? in the context of an outbreak. This is using um, different agent-based models from uh, Brian Wilder and Millen, Millen's group. Uh, this is asking the question, what does frequency do? And frequency essentially greatly removes uh, infections by keeping R below one, keeping the reproductive rate of the virus below one, it can stop outbreaks from emerging, where the moment you start to use a test, doesn't matter which sensitivity it is, the moment it starts to get weekly or every two, day, uh, two weeks, you really start to lose the benefit of a testing program if suppressing transmission is your goal. And so, and what this is really showing between the pink and the purple charts, uh, bars, is that the sensitivity really doesn't matter at all compared to the frequency of the test. And so just to give an example, because it's, uh, it's always interesting to think about what exponential growth or decay means, uh, we don't need, if we want to stop an outbreak from emerging and growing, we don't need a program to be perfect. All we need is a program that can somehow get 100 new, new infections to go on and infect less than 100 new infect, uh, people. And so a large scale rapid testing program could do that. If most people in a community uh, or even a large number of people in a community are using a rapid test on a frequent basis, that's sufficient for them to uh, find that they're positive before they go on to infect other people. And if you have 100 people go on to infect 130 people, like an R-naught of 1.3, then after a month, you'll have 600 new infections daily. If on the other hand, 100 people go on to infect 90, which sounds like not a particularly efficient program, if, if you still have 90 new infections from every 100 and you're spending all this money on rapid tests, for example, uh, that alone is enough to completely abrogate and stop outbreaks from emerging. After 30 or 35 days, you have 40 new infections instead of 600. So even though 100 people going on to infect 90 people sounds to the average person as a failing program, it's actually massively successful. And all we had to do was do that. And had we had rapid tests and other uh, procedures out last summer, we could have potentially prevented all of the surges of the of the fall and winter with a potential improvement in, in saving hundreds of thousands of lives in the United States. And this is what that essentially looks like. This is an agent-based model. Um, 
And if, uh, if you have a, a burgeoning outbreak and you start using a rapid test and whenever people find themselves positive, uh, they, they then isolate at least for a few days, uh, you can get uh, an outbreak to turn over very quickly. But again, it doesn't need to be perfect. You don't have to have perfect adherence. You could have 10% of all the tests fail. You get a 50% of people just completely refuse to listen to the results and still go to work or church, whatever it might be. But if you do have 50 or 40 or 50% of people who do want to actually use the test, say twice a week and actually not go to work if they are positive, for example, not go to church, not go. And if you do go to work, maybe take some strategies like eat lunch in the car instead of with your friends, lots of ways to slow spread if you know you're positive. But if you don't know you're positive, you really can't act on it. Uh, but this just shows that uh, if we had 50% or so adherence, we could have turned over the outbreaks very, very quickly uh, within weeks, for example. So for public health, uh, we need tests that are specific for contagious virus. We need them to be highly sensitive, again, for contagious virus. We need tests to be used frequently. We need them to be fast and actionable results, accessible. We need to have low cost and we need them to be equitable. The laboratory test that we have focused so heavily on because it's the clinical test that we're used to only fits one of those boxes. And these other inexpensive rapid tests are true public health tools. They might not be the best for diagnosing somebody as positive who was infected two weeks ago, but they will be very, very good for slipping spread. So while we have focused sens on sensitivity, I would say that the frequency of tests and the speed need to be placed into the rubric uh, uh, with which we evaluate public health tools. And if we have another pandemic and we fail to do this again, then hey, we really wouldn't have learned anything from this pandemic. Uh, and we probably won't do a good job at using testing uh, and isolating people as a means to slow spread. And I argue that that's why we have failed miserably in this pandemic to do so. So I wanna switch gears now to uh, the immunological landscape and, and talk about how we can use immunology to monitor outbreaks and study pathogens, uh, and then talk about how that can combine with computational resources to uh, monitor on a global scale uh, pathogens. So first, what we've been talking about is testing for the virus. Uh, but what I'm talking about uh, in, the, in the second half is testing for antibodies. And antibodies come up usually after the virus is getting cleared. In fact, they are part of the process of clearing and neutralizing the virus. The nice thing about antibodies is that they remain positive, which means that they can be crucial for monitoring for new outbreaks and ongoing spread of a virus and for getting things like seroprevalence to know how many people have actually already been uh, infected, which gives you all kinds of other metrics like the true uh, infection fatality rate, for example. So why serology? The serology can give you a trajectory of an outbreak. A viral test can tell you what's happening now, what's the prevalence right now, but actually monitoring for antibodies because they're long lasting, uh, they can tell you where things are moving in the future. Uh, they can give you trajectories. So I like to think about things in the, in the sense of like weather systems. With weather systems, we, we need trajectories to know if we're going to get hit with a storm tomorrow or a week from now. Testing just for the virus alone, it's very hard to do that. But if we start combining testing for the virus with serologies, all of a sudden we can start building new tools to measure the trajectory of a pathogen across a population. This might be used for all sorts of, of different public health uses on the left, like measuring herd immunity, uh, where we are relative to it, getting people to work, how to maybe deploy vaccines. We didn't use serology to figure out how best to deploy vaccines efficiently, but we could have, uh, and I hope that we do in the future. Uh, we could have efficiently measured antibodies also to all viruses simultaneously for actually less money than it takes to just measure one. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So this is an example, uh, just a very simple uh, made up example of the difference here. So what I'm showing here is every column in each of these two um, charts is, is a week in time. And what I'm showing on the left are, is what the viral signal looks like. If you're only measuring for the virus and, you're, and you take a cross section in time in a community, which I'm showing with the vertical red line, uh, 
it's possible to, if you're, if you're testing sparsely, it's possible to totally miss that an outbreak is happening if you're only testing for the pathogens themselves. And that's because the duration over which the, the signal for the virus exists is actually quite short. It might be a week or two or three weeks, depending on what virus it is. Uh, but that means that uh, the, the chances of actually finding somebody with a virus when they actually have it are rather low unless, again, uh, for the last part of the talk, unless you're testing frequently and, and fairly comprehensively. On the other hand, if you are testing for antibodies as a means to detect pathogens in a community, uh, then especially if you're testing longitudinally and you know that somebody's been negative and you're testing people over and over and over, uh, even if not particularly frequently, you can uh, identify when pathogens enter into a community because you'll have seropositive people who you know previously were not necessarily seropositive. And because the antibody, the antibody result lasts as positive for a very long time, potentially months or years, uh, you're unlikely to miss it if somebody actually got exposed and then you test them four or five weeks later that's going to be an informative test. Whereas if you're using just the virus test, somebody gets exposed and then you measure them four or five weeks later, they may be negative and you may have missed their entire infection. The antibody test uh, will be able to tell you, hey, there were, there were actually cases, there are new cases in this community and uh, it happened sometime in the last five weeks, for example. So antibody testing can be a very powerful tool to find outbreaks. People often think of it as not very useful to monitor outbreaks in real time uh, because, it, because the antibody results come up slowly, say after two weeks after somebody has been uh, initially infected. But that's, uh, that's not necessarily the best way to look at it because what you get in return is your, your sensitivity to actually find somebody as having been infected is much greater. So again, from a public health perspective, uh, that time scale really shifts. And this is just an example of that. This is also work with Brian Wilder and Millen's group. And, uh, and this is asking if we have very limited testing and we're doing viral testing versus serological testing, uh, is it possible that the improved sensitivity of a serological test to define somebody as having been recently infected can, be, can actually give you improved detection of new outbreaks? And essentially what this is showing is that if you're only testing people, a small number of people uh, on, a, on a low frequency basis, say monthly, then actually the, the time at which you'd be expecting to first discover an outbreak, which is the y-axis here, what day during the outbreak does it actually get detected? The serological response can actually become faster uh, measuring antibodies versus measuring the virus itself. So even though the virus signal will come about after say three or four days of being infected and the antibody signal within an individual might not come about for two weeks, on aggregate, you might actually do better with monitoring antibodies if you are resource constricted, for example. So antibodies can be very fast and very, very powerful tools to identify new outbreaks, even though we usually place that uh, on, on viral testing itself. So they also work together to improve allocation uh, of resources and to improve virus testing. So if you were to test for a virus in a community and you have say just 5%, you recognize that you have 5% 5, 5 PCR positivity at any given time and you do a cross section within that community, uh, you may actually, you, you won't necessarily know if that's all the information you have, is the outbreak going up or coming back down? Uh, but if you were to add serology to the mix and you get that same 5% positivity, but you know that, but you also get 55% seropositivity, meaning 55% have already been infected, then you can make an expectation that the virus is on its decline versus if the, the whole population positivity is still only 5% or so, on antibodies and there's a PCR positivity of 5%, you can expect that the virus is increasing quickly and you might wanna act on that. Uh, so these two tools oftentimes are considered distinctly, but I think they can be used very powerfully together. So there's a whole new era of, of immunological tools and this is really where a lot of the computational space will come in. And this is, uh, 
while, while what I've been discussing with regard to immunological tools is generally in the form of an ELISA-based antibody titer, for example, usually we look for one pathogen's antibody response or one individual's antibody response to one pathogen at a time. And, uh, and that can be very good. Those tests are very simple to do. They're very cheap, uh, inexpensive, like uh, called ELISAs, but they only give you data for one individual pathogen. And in fact, worse so, they don't give you any real resolution within the data uh, of that pathogen, of your response to the pathogen, meaning you get one value usually. And that one value might be actually an average of many different antibodies binding in different spots to the pathogen of interest. There's all new tools now coming about, and these are some of the tools that we develop. And this particular assay that I'm showing results from here was developed by Steve Elledge's lab at Harvard Medical School. Uh, came from that science 2015 paper. And now we've been building on this technology quite a bit. What I'm showing here on the bottom left are results from this tool called VIRSCAN. Each column here is an individual. Each row is a single peptide. Uh, and if it's colored in with red, it means that an individual had an antibody to that peptide. And the peptide might be a 28 or 56 amino acid peptide from a pathogen. What we do is we take all of the genomes from pathogens, the full proteomes of all the viruses known to infect humans, and we can program them into phage. Phage you could think of as little robots that, uh, that express whatever we want them to express. So we can have every phage uh, virus express on its surface a little peptide. That peptide reflects a portion of a virus. What we can do is we can combine hundreds of thousands of these types of phage together into a mixture, and then we can drop just a single drop of blood into that mixture. With just a drop, in fact, less than a drop, 0.1 microliters, we can put into that mixture, we let it incubate, and then we, we have tools to actually pull out any of the phage that have an antibody from that person's blood in it. And with that, we can deconvolute and figure out what antibodies people actually had by sequencing the phage that come out of the solution with antibodies on it. And we get a picture like this, where we actually get individual antibodies against huge numbers of pathogens. I'm showing four pathogens here. Each pathogen has multiple peptides uh, shown, uh, but actually this list goes down for about 400 additional pathogens. So it's a huge array of data. And this is all just from one drop of blood in one well. So it's a very, very simple and inexpensive test to be able to perform. What it means is instead of getting one antibody result for a given pathogen, for a given individual, we actually get uh, tens to hundreds of different antibody results per pathogen for hundreds of pathogens per blood spot. So it becomes a very powerful tool and we start thinking about how can we actually perform global immunological surveillance to monitor for new outbreaks. And so this is, uh, this technology I think can lead or technologies like this can lead to what I think of as uh, the next era of how to use immunology to monitor pathogens for what I think of as true global surveillance and, and what I would like to see built and what I'm working with colleagues at, at Princeton and NIH and Wellcome Trust to do is to build a global immunological observatory. And, uh, and this would be very much like a weather system and weather systems have buoys to monitor the weather uh, at any given time. And we can uh, instead use, uh, instead of buoys, we could use convenience samples coming from hospitals and blood banks, and potentially as I'll show even saliva samples to get antibody repertoires from people and run very high throughput uh, techniques like the one that I was just showing you uh, to actually build an, an amass an amazing amount of data to start learning the rules of viruses, very, very similar to how it took us just building this framework of, of, of weather buoys and weather balloons and, and monitoring stations. And once we started accruing the data, then we start building the new tools and methods to actually predict the weather. But before we had all of that in place, we couldn't predict the weather. We didn't have the data, we didn't know the tools. And what the weather system did was it actually ushered in not just weather uh, instruments, but it ushered in a whole new era of computational uh, tools and models that extend far beyond the weather system. So it really did create, it was a, it's a platform that has versioned off into massive numbers of other tools and technologies that extend well beyond the weather, um, including into satellites and things like that.
Um, and so I think of the Global Immunological Observatory as a similar, similarly ambitious plan that can have uh, similar uh, impacts, if not you know, great impacts to essentially identify and prevent pandemics in the future. And so while we can use this kind of data to actually per perform global surveillance, uh, we can get the data from all different types of places. Uh, and so whether that's from government programs or nursing homes, direct to consumer, uh, academic surveillance, the point of this slide is just to show that there, is, that there are tons of ways that we might consider getting these types of data from humans and treating humans as sort of like weather buoys, but immunological observatory buoys. And, uh, and there might even be a room for people to make money by donating their blood if they want to serve as an ongoing weather buoy, for example. So it can become a system that can self-sustain itself if we want it to. And the potential utility uh, is vast. Uh, you know, if we look at the weather system now, we know that having the weather system has entirely changed how we farm and when people, uh, when people are planning to, to raise their crops and, you know, everything else under the sun, uh, when we decide to walk out of the house with an umbrella. I think that we could do very similar things if we are able to predict pathogens, maybe instead of grabbing an umbrella, we grab a mask because we know that there's a lot of influenza in our community during these three weeks or so. Uh, so there could be a, a massive potential for it to limit not just new pandemics, but endemic pathogens as well. So to actually do this, there are a few different key pieces of technology we might want. We might want to be able to discriminate closely related viruses using the immunological repertoire. We might want to improve longitudinal sample collection because having specimens collected over time in the same individual can be very, very powerful to identify new exposures which represent new outbreaks occurring. Uh, and we might want to improve the access of, of these specimens for disease surveillance. So I'll just quickly go through how new tools can and new approaches computationally can help facilitate this. So if we go back to Zika, which now Zika feels like a lifetime ago, uh, but the Zika epidemic reinforced that we need to be able to find immunological tools that, that discriminate between closely related pathogens. Uh, it took almost a year before we actually had good immunological tools that could tell you if your patient had Zika versus dengue. And this actually was uh, quite devastating for patients who would show up in the hospital, uh, especially for patients who were pregnant uh, because Zika has congenital defects as one of its um, outcomes. If a patient was pregnant, you really wanted to know, was it Zika or was it dengue? And it was very, very difficult at the time to use the serological tools that we had to figure that out. Uh, but we could take something like the, we could take the very high resolution display of something like Veerscan or these phage display tools. And what I'm showing here are different people on the columns and different peptides from, from uh, Zika virus on the, on the left uh, as the rows. And what we can see is there are subtle differences between the antibody repertoires that Zika positive people versus dengue positive people have but there's not a clear delineating group of peptides that really can say uh, on their own whether it is Zika or dengue. But we can then drill down. We, I won't go into detail here, but we can take one individual peptide and blast it apart and do mutagenesis to identify where exactly the antibodies are binding on a peptide. And so in this case, we could see that the antibodies on that one peptide that I've highlighted in red the antibodies actually, we can use different mutagenesis tools to say, okay, if you don't have the bottom 12 amino acids as part of that peptide, it is, uh, it's, your antibodies won't bind. So we can do this and we can really map the footprints, almost like taking somebody's fingerprint. We can really map the footprints of where somebody's individual antibodies will bind. And those can be specific to pathogen. If you had been exposed to dengue versus Zika, that binding property might be slightly distinct. And we can do that over a whole plethora of different peptides for people with Zika or dengue and start to build, um, build models, build supervised uh, machine learning models. And what we can do is we can push those into, into different AI algorithms. And uh, with enough data, we can start to develop the pattern recognition software to be able to say, this is an antibody repertoire that comes from a Zika infected person versus a dengue, even though no single antibody is able to 
discover that. But the pattern, which isn't always the same across people, uh, but the patterns can uh, ultimately facilitate it. And so this is just one example where we were able to take the, the uh, antibody-based data, put it into uh, one neural network here, and we were able to uh, essentially get a decent ROC curve for Zika versus dengue discrimination. But when we actually did a, a larger ensemble approach, we were able to very quickly get 100% accuracy to discriminate Zika versus dengue in this, in this cohort. Uh, and this actually took almost no training of the, of the model. This was actually quite uh, uh, surprising. And so had we done this, this had we already had the library set up, for example, we could have very quickly created a discriminatory algorithm to, to figure out Zika versus dengue. And now what we can do is use this, for example, to discriminate even more closely related pathogens, different dengue types, uh, different rhinovirus types, different coronavirus types, for example. So these tools, the data is just amassing in huge numbers. And this is just scratching the surface of how this type of data might be able to be utilized for true global surveillance. We might want to improve longitudinal sample collection. What I'm showing here are, are this data right here. Uh, each You could see different pathogens, and each of those show antibodies, similar thing within each one. You can see different rows for different peptides for one of those pathogens. But what is very difficult to see because it's so robust is that each of these columns actually contains many individual columns of data taken from one person over years of life. And so what you can see is it almost makes a barcode per individual. This is all one individual that I'm showing. For each pathogen, I'm showing a few years of life. And what you can see is that there is a barcoding pattern. And the interesting thing here is that all of us have unique barcodes, meaning our immunological repertoire represents us. It's like a biological fingerprint. And the way that we respond to a pathogen is almost hard-coded into us once we respond to that pathogen. We keep those antibodies, and that's because our memory goes into our bone marrow, and we continue to always produce those same antibodies over time. Uh, you can see, for example, in this person, they got flu A, probably either a vaccine or an infection, but they, they got flu A, and so you can see that this individual didn't have particularly robust antibody responses against many parts of flu. But when they actually did get it right here, that they ended up over time, over the next six or 12 months with a, with a small subset of new antibodies. Uh, and that's distinct from flu B. It's difficult to see, but flu B, they actually got a couple of months or maybe a year before flu A. So there are distinctions, but, uh, but ultimately these barcodes might be useful for identifying individual samples as coming from the same person. And this is exactly what we've been working on, using different, uh, different AI tools and statistical approaches to, uh, to almost treat the antibody repertoire similar to how we treat DNA sequencing, where we, we can identify two blood samples as coming from the same person, say for forensics or any other use, based on their DNA sequence. In this case, this is a truly random but, uh, but stable uh, biological fingerprint for, for an individual. And so it could be used uh, for developing longitudinal cohorts. So what you can see here, for example, if we take different pathogens and different people across time, we just see them as a, a bunch of dots. Uh, and each of these is a different blood sample in each of these pathogens over here on the left. But when we use this new tool that, uh, that Mariah Mitchell and, and my group has been really developing, we can start to link those dots over time to say, hey, these dots are actually, there's multiple people in the data set who have donated blood multiple times in a row. And we can start building longitudinal cohorts, which can be very, very powerful for outbreak surveillance and detection. So, and the nice thing here is that it's the exact same data that's allowing us to link the data points uh, is the data that we want for outbreak detection because it is the antibody responses to the pathogens that can enable serological surveillance. So we could use this data in very, very powerful ways. Uh, and this is just an example of a longitudinal cohort. Uh, this is each from one drop of blood at each time point, we're able to just get a whole plethora of different pathogen responses. And so what I'm showing here, these are individuals who are monitored over time and had measles vaccines. And so you can see that they all shot up for measles and rubella at the same time. And that's because they got an MMR vaccine, for example. So we can also uh, improve our ability to actually detect 
uh, to, to get serological um, surveys performed and actually get this data. If we start moving away from blood, and this is just to show that I think in the future, we can actually get very, very good results from saliva. Our saliva, our gums essentially have all these micro perforations in them. And that means that there are antibodies that secrete into, uh, including IgG antibodies that secrete into our saliva all the time. Uh, and we can actually use that to identify, we could have people uh, give saliva samples instead of blood samples. And that might be sufficient to actually do very robust serological surveys. Uh, so this is something I think we could potentially see, I call it spit and drop. Maybe instead of having people do dried blood spots, we can have people spit in tubes and just drop those tubes into collection containers and, and it could be anonymous uh, surveillance. Um, people would just uh, freely spit into a tube or whatever it might be, drop that tube into a bucket and maybe somebody can then come and pick up the bucket later and use that for ongoing surveillance uh, throughout the world. And there might be, you might end up seeing these stations. So there's lots of different ways to think about how we can perform surveillance. And all of this can come together to create what, what uh, Brian Grenfell and Jess Metcalf and myself, those are two faculty at Princeton, have discussed uh, quite a bit about this global immune observatory where maybe there's a whole um, core kind of group of, of uh, an immunological core, mathematical core, a biorepository core, and all of these can collect the specimens. You have a group of different immune assays that are performed on each of those specimens, for example. Uh, the data can be ported to a mathematical modeling core, uh, very similar to how the weather systems today work. Uh, and so I think that if the world wants to put something like this in place, it could be one of the greatest bangs for the buck, uh, if you will, in terms of actually uh, helping prevent future outbreaks. And it's going to uh, entail massive new uh, developments in, in computational algorithms to, that we can't even really comprehend right now what exactly those would be. Uh, but if we actually start doing this and start building the, the, the technology and the tools to actually capture this type of data, I think that we would come up with a huge array of new approaches. <clears throat> so just to conclude, I think uh, we've had uh, massive advances in virology and, and immunology over the, the last year in particular, but even before um, that are really enabling new efforts in public health. Um, I think that this pandemic, I hope has taught us that the classical tools are useful for medicine, but they're not the same tools as public health. And we need to, uh, we need to push on public health efforts much more. Uh, public health is almost always underfunded and undervalued. And, uh, but the public health tools of tomorrow are actually, I think, extraordinarily exciting. Uh, and we'll be bringing together a whole new eras of sort of biocomputational uh, collaborations. Uh, diagnostic medicine is not the same as public health. Uh, I've spent the last year of my life trying to say this, uh, and, it's, and it's just not the tools are different. Um, and I think that, uh, that where we're going, it's, I'm very excited to see sort of what academia does, how AI and, and biology continue to, to come together as of course they've been for the, you know, for the last quite, quite a number of years um, to really leverage these, these biological tools that are being built in, in much greater numbers now. They're all going to require um, advanced computation to go with them. And, and I think that Anyone who's interested in this world is going to um, have a lot of work to do in the future. Uh, so I'll stop there. I want to just um, thank uh, many of uh, my collaborators on all of this work. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with all of them, and uh, I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you. That was a very interesting talk. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, uh, Samira Daniel, you, do you want to unmute and ask your questions about whether asymptotics generate enough viral load? Uh, yeah, I'm right here. Uh, that was my question. I'm uh, that, that uh, I, I see I, the groups that um, make that claim that asymptomatics don't, I mean, there's, they run all, you know, the, the gamut. It's not as if they're all anti-vaxxers or vaccine hesitants, or uh, it, it just seems to be a, a question that hasn't really been answered that well. 
Uh, sorry, I don't think I got the question. What was the question? Whether asymptomatics carry enough of a viral load to infect others. Oh, well, from a transmission perspective, I think uh, uh, whether it's asymptomatics or pre-symptomatics, I mean, we know that people can definitely carry very high viral loads before they, before they become symptomatic. And so uh, if the question is really stemming from can we just do symptomatic testing alone to be able to inhibit transmission? The answer is simply no. We know that so much of the symptom onset is immunological in nature. And so we know that people become transmissible with very high viral loads, oftentimes a couple of days before they show any symptoms. Um, uh, whether somebody who remains entirely asymptomatic. Yeah, entirely, after, entirely symptomatic is the question. Well, I think, I think it's hard to, to know, but what I can say is we have a lot of data from the university settings, for example, where we know that people are totally asymptomatic when they go on and transmit, whether they then go on and ever develop any symptoms after their transmission. Uh, I would say that the data has generally showed that, that it can happen, but what, how much it contributes uh, is unknown. I would say yeah. that um, I'm, I don't particularly get too concerned about it because I'm much more concerned about finding people before they transmit versus before they develop sim symptoms. Yeah. Got it. Um, the next question is from Bruno Bowden. Uh, do you want to unmute and introduce yourself and ask the question? Oh, hi there, Michael. Um, so I lead the team that built the uh, COVID-19 app for the World Health Organization, formerly ran engineering on Google Earth. And the point is that you talk about the, the value of the uh, frequency and um, fast uh, result of, a, of an antigen test. And I think that there's a step further you can go um, through a smartphone app, you can detect COVID-19 with about 0. AUC for asymptomatic patients based on a cough recording. And you add in other signals as well. I think it's possible to get to the point, uh, the accuracy up to sort of like 0. 0.85 or 0. 0.9 AUC. And the question is about how we can combine this and particularly how, how I can reach you and talk to you about this. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's great and, and great, to, great to see you again. Um, I think, uh, you know, it's very similar also to the scratch and sniff um, and, and this, the smell test and there are these, I think it's, it, what you're hitting on is this large continuum where we have put all of our focus on the most expensive, the most difficult to produce, the most sensitive test. And in so doing, you know, I would say rapid antigen tests are one side of that, or are sort of pushing on the continuum. And then what you're getting at is there's this whole huge continuum when you start bringing all of that together, you get extraordinary accuracy, probably if you do it well with some of the most simple, basic things that we all have in our pockets all the time, potentially. I completely agree. And I do hope, you know, um, I feel like it's, I've put my, my efforts towards these rapid tests because they're one step, you know, it's, it's the one step that I think people could at least envision, okay, this is something that's really worth doing. I think it's going to be a lot more work to really get that whole ecosystem developed. But I think it is probably one of the most important things we could possibly do uh, for the future is to learn to use this as an experience now to learn how to actually do this, to, to learn what are the tools, whether it's cough and, and your voice uh, when you yell into a, into a closed box or, you know, I've seen so many different approaches to trying to identify infectious people. And that seems to work pretty well. They might not be specific at the end of the day. So far, specificity has been a little bit obscured because the, mo the primary pathogen has been SARS-CoV-2, uh, which means that once flu and RSV and things are around, maybe, maybe the algorithms will get confused a bit, but that's okay. It's a screening test. I, I completely agree that we should be really focusing on those. All right. Um, we are at noon exactly, and I would like to wrap up and if, do you have any questions? What is the best way to reach you, Michael? Uh, well, it's, <laughs> uh, my, my inbox has um, spent the year exploding. And so it's rather difficult um, for me Twitter, to triage Twitter. appropriately. <laughs> yeah, Twitter, exactly. <laughs> Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I get you. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah. um, 
I think, uh, you know, you can try emailing me. I, I just will have to apologize ahead of time uh, that I just can't respond to everyone. Totally understandable. Understandable. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for presenting your work, your research here. We really appreciate it. And we also would like to thank the audience for asking lots of great questions. And